Welcome to Beyond Film School, where I teach you all about the film industry. I'm Amber, and in this video, we are going deep into the electrical department in film with an interview that I did with Frank LaFrazia. He is New York City-based Local 52 member and a lighting board operator with a love of lighting. So let's jump into the interview. You're amazing. You have lots of experience. So that's why I wanted to talk to you. <laughs> and plus you have a great personality. And I feel like you really explain things really well to like, not to say it layman's terms, but like where people yeah. outside the industry can just like really understand. So I, okay. I just want to get into like your background of like sure. how you got started sure. and, and like why you're yeah. in the yeah. department that you're in, the electrics department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Well, actually what's funny is like um, you say that um, part of the reason why I am able to explain things well. I used to teach, and that's actually part of my background. So I'll give you a little bit of a history of my background. So I actually came up in theater. I did not come up in film. I came up in theater, and I actually have I actually have a BFA in acting, really useful degree. But I always did um, no. But I always and I and I had done artistic work theater wise. I did um, right, and I also taught theater wise artistically. But I always did production on the side. So even when I was in college, I was hanging lights. I was building sets, but I always liked lighting best. It always was the most interesting to me. The reason why lighting is the most interesting to me, um, part of it is that it's ephemeral. I love that it's like we are using this. It's not. It's not. It's not a. It's not a bench that you move around. It's actually <laughs> like we're, you know we're, we're casting this light and shadow. We're using color. We're using you know how do you you can set tone. You can set the scene. You can like I used to do a lot of uh, lighting for dance. And so in lighting for dance, you actually sculpt the body. And I used to love that because it's like you take light and you, and just like you do in film and you cut it from the side and you sculpt the face or you sculpt the body for how it shows up in dance, which is live or in film, which is going to then, because what is film? Film is light bouncing off of objects that's being projected onto what used to be like a, um, you know, a negative that then yep. was projected, blah, blah, blah. Now it's onto a digital thing, but it's the same thing. If you don't have lighting, then it's just radio. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so that's what got me, that's what got me, ex, uh, you know, engaged in lighting. And then one of the early jobs that I had, I was asked actually the master electrician, which is kind of like the best boy position to the gaffer uh, and, and theater world the master electrician is the assistant to the lighting designer. And I did that for many years. And then I actually got a job at Bennington College in Bennington, Vermont. And one of the things that Bennington does, it's very multidisciplinary. So we also did play with like film. It was also like dance on film, theater on film, as well as like live performance, blah, blah, blah. So I did a lot of different types of lighting like that. I'm a native New Yorker, but I was living in, um, I was living in New England at the time because I had um, a child up there and, um, and I got that job at Bennington. And then the union in uh, New England was like, got really busy because they, they passed a tax incentive. So there was a lot of film work oh, yeah. coming to Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And so it was basically, so, you know, like I knew from a friend, it was like, hey, they actually could use a guy like you because I really know dimming systems and computerized light boarding, which we can talk about more about what that's about. And so folks were like, you would be a great addition to, you know, a film crew. So I kind of threw my name in the hat. And of course, the thing is when you jump into film, you know, it was kind of like, oh, great, you know, dimming systems. Yeah, okay, great. Pull some cable, you know, so I really had to like, <laughs> sorry, pay, pay my dues again. You know, no, no, I appreciate the laughter. It makes me feel better. So I had to like pay my dues again. Pull cable. But you know what, it was the best thing that could ever happen. Because I had to do it up in New England in 481, work my way from the ground up, learning cable, learning voltage, wattage, learning capacities, learning every piece of film equipment known to man in lighting and grip world because so you can understand what the heck you're doing because it's a totally different equipment than in the theater world. Yeah. Same electricity, same computerized dimming system, same dimmers. Okay, those are the same between theater and film, okay? But the actual equipment we use, a lot of it's different and a lot of it is – um, very much, um, you know, uh, what's what I'm looking for, particular proprietary for film and TV versus what we do, in the, what, what I used to do in theater. Then I got an email from uh, Local 52 here in New York and was like, hey, you know, we, we could use more technicians down in New York. And if you have a card, come on down. I was from New York. So I came here. I stayed with my sibling, you know, or, or a cousin or something, um, started doing 52 work. And then I was like, you know what? Writing's on the wall. 
industry's taking off, and I moved back to New York full time and I pursued film full time. So now I have both union cards. I have an IATSE card to, as a film technician for 52, which covers Connecticut all the way down to Delaware, and then I also have a union card up in New England, which carry which is uh, so I can do the whole East Coast from yeah. Maine all the way down to Delaware. That's awesome. Uh, well, not the whole East Coast. So what do you yeah. do now in the industry? Like, right, what is so your position now? now? Right. So now the main thing I'm doing is that I am the light board operator. What does that mean exactly? Okay, so um, it's getting more and more and more advanced, and the light board operator is becoming more and more and more integral to every set everywhere, LA, New York, everywhere. And why? Why is that happening? Primarily because LED lights are becoming so incredibly prominent. LED lights are becoming so good now. Like, you know, 10 years ago, it's like, oh, it's a decent LED light, but it'll never replace a Tweeny or a 1K or a 2K. Now they do. Now it's like you can take a sky panel, you can take many different type of LED lights and place them and they and they're now even have sky panel 360s, which are like ginormous. We would be in that giant atrium with big, yeah. beautiful windows, right? Well, yeah. how do you manipulate the light so that, okay, well, fine, the sun happens to be here and the beautiful lights come here, but really we needed to, you know, shade, you know, get the actor filled in here. We brought in that giant sky panel. I was controlling it with my computerized light board in the corner, making it happen. So what happens? So what, how does this work? So the gaffer is there with the DP. So the director of photography talks about, you know, camera sets up here. This is what we're looking at. This is what we're doing. Okay, we need to fill in this light. And then a lot of times the gaffer then, you know, radios to me, hey, Frank, you know, we need to take those lights that we pre-hung, that we already know work, that you flashed out through your computerized light board, bring those up to, you know, 50%, make them 3,200 tungsten, or make them 5,600 daylight or something in between now with some of these lights i can add green to make it look more like we're in an office i can take away green i can add a little blue i can you know i can add things not just party light but add things that are like the tones that you would catch either in a setting that's like you know whatever anything from a desert scene to an office scene to whatever and you can do it quickly and easily through the light board that I use in order to like adjust that. And then technicians will then still on set, bring in a light and they may bring in an LED light, set it up, hook it up with the data information. I punch it in, I make it go. I even control the tungsten lights as well that are on set. So like in a typical like actual set at a stage or a studio, you might hang like all your chandeliers and your sconces and your this and your that. And, uh, and even just like that lamp that's next to the actor or, or everything. And then even the light that's pounding in through the window. Like say you have a, a 10 K on a pipe or a five K on a pipe. Instead of having a technician walk over to it, flick it on and m- manipulate the dimmer. I control from my light board. I'm turning the light on. I'm manipulating the dinner. Maybe the, Technician goes over to move it, you know, tip it down, put it into a better place. But then I can do the minor adjustments just from the whiteboard in order to make things move quicker, more efficiently and safer um, within, you know, trying to, you know, get, get, get the shot, get that scene going and blah, blah, blah. I guess this might be a controversial question here then because no, if no your job, no, no controversy here. Yeah. But, <laughs> so if your job really is, is you're controlling a lot of the lights that are on set, then yeah. does that or have you seen that it eliminates the amount of electricians that you need for a production? No, absolutely not. Because because what was the first thing I said? How does the light physically get there? Yeah, exactly. The right? light has to get there. The light has to either get hung, the highlight has to get set. And then let's face it. Hey, oh, wait, this doesn't work. Let's move that camera six feet to the right. <laughs> so who's going to now move the three lights that are set? I'm not going to jump off the board and move them because that's not efficient. So the three technicians who were already on the call sheet to begin with, who are already part of the crew, the three technicians quickly jump in and maybe they need two backup people to wrangle cable. It's the same thing. You still got to run cable to a light. There's no such thing as wireless electricity. Okay. I mean, there was Tesla tried it, blew some stuff up, but you know, but like, you know, you still have to physically plug in the light. The light yeah. needs to physically be plugged in, make sure it's working. I can manipulate it after it's working. Sure, for like levels and stuff, like make it brighter, make it make, give it a color. And yeah, you're eliminating time because like you're not putting gel as much in front of the lights, maybe less yeah. ND and stuff like that. But you still need technicians to move the lights around, put them in place, plug them in, make sure they're work, troubleshoot them when they're broken, right? Like it doesn't mean, oh, you plug it in, works right away. Yeah, right. You plug it in, you gotta make sure it's working. And yeah. it could be many reasons why it's not. So no, it doesn't, it doesn't eliminate, it makes it go quicker. It makes it go safer yeah. because like, you have to, you're less touching like super hot lights. You're using less voltage. So you may be using less wattage and making it less hot on set, but you're still 
having the same amount of lights basically, but now maybe mm -hmm. half of them are LED and half of them are tungsten, as opposed to like all of them being really hot tungsten lights that heat up a set, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so I feel like it's just gotten way more efficient then. It's just not yeah. a lot, like a lot less manpower or physical manpower to actually like, oh, I have to go up this ladder now and adjust the light physically. Yeah. Yes. So I, I wanted to get into like the, the hierarchy of the department. So, I mean, the head of our department is the gaffer. Um, and actually it's an old, this is a funny story. I'll tell you a quick story because I love uh, history stories. Uh, the term gaffer actually is a medieval term. And it just means like, it's the person literally who went to the center of the town and was like, hear ye, hear ye, those people over there, they have turnips. Let's go buy their turnips. Seriously, it was the person who yelled and told people what to do. So the term gaffer, Back in the olden days in film, it, it was not the chief lighting technician. The gaffer was whoever was kind of like the most senior member of the crew. And it could have been the head props guy. It could have been the head grip. And they would just like, all right, this is how we're going to set up the shot. Hey, uh, Joe and Bob, you go over there. You know what I mean? Like we're first, first, the, first the set dressers are going to come in and then we're going to come in or whatever. Uh, but then what was happening was the chief lighting technician, which is the head of the lighting department, kind of became that role more and more and more because that's how it worked with the, with the DP. Because what happens is the DP, the director of photography, will say, hey, this is what we're doing for the shot. This is how it lines up. And then he'll start lighting it. Right. And so because he starts lighting it first, then basically the chief lighting technician became the gaffer because it became like, okay, I'm the gaffer. I'm the person who's going to say, this is what's happening first. We're going to put that light over there and it's going to go that way. Okay. Well then that's going to tell the grips that they have to then come in with sandbags over there. They have to put a stand over there because we don't have the correct stand for it. Or maybe it goes up on the side of a mountain and we need a special thing for it, blah, blah, blah. So the gaffer, head of the lighting department, head of the electric department, they decide where the lights go based on what the uh, what the director of photography is you know saying. They work together. They collaborate. This is what we're going to do, right? Then you basically have uh, um, then underneath that person, then you have a best boy, and the best boy is basically the or best person, sorry, uh, and that person basically is the person who is they are in charge of too many things. They are in charge <laughs> of not just hiring and like firing manpower uh time cards who gets paid what when where they also are technically in charge of the crew itself like they're the ones that be like all right so you know because the gaffer wants to stay close to the director of photography and sometimes doesn't need to get into all the minutiae of how it's getting done so really the best boy would be like all right well we're going to take three technicians and put them over there and take care of that we'll take people blah, 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 as well as all the sort of behind the scenes getting stuff done also, then the gaffer will call out to the light board operator, this guy. And well, you know, so while like those technicians are setting up some lights, the, the light board, the gaffer might be talking to the light board operator and be like, hey, okay, Frank, so the lights we already pre rigged, I'll talk about the rigging department in a sec, pre rigged uh, and are on right now. Let's dim those down to like 50%. They're way too bright. Click, click, click. Okay, great. Now they're 50%. Now it's getting closer to what the DP is looking for, um, setting that up. So we've got the technicians going around, setting up the lights plugging them in it's all that the electrics do they're going to plug the light in make sure it's on make sure it works anybody who's like at that entry level it's a third whether gotcha. you're an on-set lighting technician whether you're a, a rigging guy whether you're you know it doesn't matter if you if you're at this level and then a seconds rate is like your best boys and stuff right and then, okay. key, and then key rate is like gaffer board op stuff like that electricians are not just responsible for plugging in the lights on set that's the primary job but after that they also are in charge of all power for the entire set. So if you've got hair and makeup and wardrobe and they need power, electricians have to make sure to do that. The dolly uh, that has the camera on it, they have little motors inside. We got to run a single extension to the dolly. Oh, I did, sure did not know yeah, that. Did not know that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we can't leave them out there. And if, they're, if their dolly runs out, it, can, it can't go up and down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. trust me, electrics get yelled at. You know, you're in <laughs> trouble. You know, now you just slowed everything down, right? And plug that in. Oh, craft service needs to be set up. God forbid you don't I get know. your coffee, right? <laughs> so we have to make sure that's set up and that we're good and we're good to go. And that they have power. So every department, if you need power, you talk to an electrician. Someone in our department is going to take care of that. They're going to make sure that that happens, right? So it's not just telling you like that is our main priority. Obviously, lighting the set, lighting the shot, but it's also that. I'm going to talk to you about the rigging department for a second. Yeah, you want to talk about that? yeah, yeah. for sure. So. So rigging department, obviously this is for bigger jobs. You know, this isn't for your student film, but most bigger jobs have a rigging department. What do they do? So the rigging department, they're going to get there earlier that day, the day before, a month before, weeks before, yeah. it depends on how big the project is. And they're the ones that are going to like head up giant lights, 
to lay out the big cable because you don't want to show up with your, you know, fast moving cameras and be like, Oh, everybody stop. We got to wait. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but a four out cable, which is like the biggest cable we carry a hundred foot four out cable weighs 97 pounds. Holy crap. So it takes a large crew. You have to yeah. lay out five of those at once, one at a time, but five because you need a hot, a hot, a hot, a neutral and a ground. That's just one run. So imagine if you're like, all right, city block, I need big lights way over there because we're lighting the background. All right, I'm going to put a generator over there, but I still got to run 300 feet of four on, yeah. right? Think of how long that would take. You're not going to wait around for that, right? No. So that's why the rigging crew gets there before, lays out all the cable, puts out the big lights. Um, and then, of course, we show up and every piece of work the rigging crew did was, was a mistake. No, I'm just <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so uh, like... <laughs> Rigging right. versus shooting. Ah! <laughs> right. But the rigging, but no, but a good rigging crew actually plans for that. So yeah. like, you know, uh, like our rigging gaffer is great because he will lay out the run that they talked about on the scout. He'll also leave extra cable for us everywhere and runs going in other directions for when the DP goes, you know what? I said we were looking that way. No, no, no we're going to look this way. Yeah. Adjust in case. Yeah, and then just, yeah, uh, as we call it, the oh shit cable, right? Yeah. And so that, then, then we're quickly running out some of the oh shit cable, hopefully using what's pre-existing there to then connect to that and then back to the generator, et cetera, okay, and get that going. So, and the rigging crew is also the people who are in the stages, like day one, like the sets are built, it's looking good. All right, well, let's get the rigging crew in there because they're the ones that got to put the all the lights up all above all the sets. And not just it's not just the power anymore. Let's go back to my job. Now we have to run data. We, in order for these lights to work, you have to tell, you have to run actual, it's called DMX cable, and it sends data. Same thing like we're talking now on this computer. It's all ones and zeros, right? Yeah. So it's like ones and zeros data talking to that light. Well, that cable needs to be run as well on top of the power cable um, that needs to run. And you have to like map it out and do it properly and plan ahead so that it's all squared away. Because when you walk in day one, what do you think? That's that was there in, in a day? No. <laughs> It took like months, you know, weeks or months. To get You'd be up. surprised on how many people actually think that. They're like, well, who does this? It's not us that does it. I'm like, well, we have to hire someone that actually does that. <laughs> yes. I know, and it takes a long time, you know, and like, and, and look, and we've all been in that position where you get these unrealistic expectations and people are like, well, why can't we just move all that? It's like, okay, well, we can, but that's going to take time and money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, it's, it's sorry, like quality. It's a, I think quality, quality sorry, speed quality. and money, all right? right? Probably speed money, right? You want it fast and good? Well, that's gonna cost a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This video is brought to you by the Beyond Film School Set PA Starter Kit. I personally curated this kit myself to make sure that you can have and find all the things you need to make sure you can kill it on set. It might be your very first day on a film set, or you might be up in your game to make sure you're more prepared. Either way, this kit will have you prepared, feeling confident, and you are going to be looking like a more trusted seed. And PA straight out the gate. This kit also includes an awesome book by Daniel Scarpatti, Gophers on the Front Lines of TV and Film. It is a really, really great book to let you know what you are getting yourself into if you are just starting out in film. My only wish is that something like this existed when I first started out in film, so I'm trying to give that to you to make sure you are more confident on your first day on set. So visit beyondfilmschool.com to get your set PA starter kit. How does one, I mean, because I feel like the way you're talking about it, there are a lot of things that I, I guess might be like, what is he talking about? Oh my God, that's so much yeah, that yeah, someone yeah. can, There's a lot it of has to learn, right? So how right. does one start to be an electrician? Like how, I mean, like you had a different uh, route, but like, how yeah. do you see people coming there's, up sure, in the sure, industry? Sure. There's a lot of, well, there's a lot of routes. There's a lot of different routes. Uh, one is you can go to a rental house. You know, a lot of people I know came up through rental houses. They'll just kind of like, uh, whether it's Ari or Insight or, um, you know, any of the many rental houses that are out there, they have film equipment. And um, some of them even started as like interns at rental houses. And then actually, you know, they're on staff pulling equipment and cable and, and, and learning the gear and learning how it works. So, and then they kind of work their way in. A lot of people uh, come up in the non-union world. You know, and like, and that's great too. Like, yeah, come up in the non-union world. You know, uh, th there's actual like a there is actual a, a book. So, okay, if anybody's interested in becoming an electrician, they should buy the um, Harry Box book. So it's the Set Technician's Handbook. Oh, this is amazing. Okay, and it's by Harry Box. All right, you're gonna get this book. 
Harry box. And when you buy it, and, and you should actually buy it, because the reason why is now this textbook also now comes with an online version that then you can interact with, and they keep it up to date. So you, it is it is actually beneficial to buy it full price as opposed to like, hey, I grabbed it, I used it off of Amazon. And this book, it, this is the Bible. This has like, you know, everything. Harry Box is an is old school gaffer in LA. Um, and uh, you can learn about this stuff. So you jump into the non-union world. You start like putting yourself out there for a student film when you're young. You know, you just kind of be like, hey. And here, like, cause let me tell you right now. Let me guess what the, let me tell you what the most non-glamorous job is. It's, you know, it's gripping electric, right? You know what I mean? Like nobody really wants to be on a gripping electric swing. Woo! You know, right? Everyone wants, to be a, everyone wants to be the director or the DP or, you know, right? They want to be fancy, right? Yeah. Um, and that's great. You know, I mean, I'm not knocking that, you know what I mean? That's wonderful. I mean, hell, I went, I went to school for acting, you know I mean? Like, you know, that's fine. That's great. But for me, it was like, I wanted to work and I wanted to help create the work. And I wasn't willing to sit around and let other people decide when I, my work was worthy, you know, and I really took to this. And so I jumped in and so I got my feet wet, hands dirty, you know, and just kind of like jump in. So yeah, go, go the student, student films, because you know, you'll get paid crap, but you'll learn so much. I know. I tell everyone that is coming up and whatever they want to do. And they're just saying out like, get on short films, indie sets, just volunteer for a weekend. If you have time off, because you're going to learn so much more on your first day in an indie set versus a union set. Because on a union set, you're going to be sitting in a lockup all day and doing nothing and seeing nothing. Then listen, and then if you, and then when you start getting your skills and you're feeling good, contact the union, apply, um, you know, you live in New York, that's local 52, each, you know, you know, if, if you're different places, contact the union, you know, and, and you just apply. Um, it's the thing about the way the unions are structured, which is a good thing is it's very residence based. So you have to like really be committed to be like, I'm staying in New York and I'm going to make this work in New York or if New York's not your bag, you know, and you want to go to LA, Atlanta, New Orleans, whatever, but you need to establish residency wherever you are. And then be like, because the, the way the unions work is for these jobs, the, the, what they call the below the line jobs, they want to give it to local populations. And it makes sense. It's like, we're not going to fly some dude in from LA to, you know what I mean? To run some cable and hang a light. You know, this is something that could, they're very, very well paying jobs here yeah. in New York that can be given to, you know, people who live in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area and, and, and really benefit from it. So yeah. yes, so start, start with your student film, start with, or you can start, like I said, a rental houses or places to go, um, you know, work, work your way up. There's tons of education resources out there. You can, if you're interested in like what I do, the board op stuff, you can take a course with ETC. Uh, ETC is the name of the company that makes the light boards that I work on. Oh, that's amazing. You can, take a course, you can take an online course with them. You can go to their actual ETC place here in New York and you'll, you know, and sign up and you pay or whatever it is and you're working on it and, and, you know, and, you know, and all of a sudden you're starting to learn the language and be done with that. Think about board hopping though. You want to be a, an actual 52 or, you know, on satellite. You want to learn how to be a real electric from the ground up. You don't really want to come in, oh, hey, I'm a board op, you know, yeah. white, white glove it. You really want to come from the ground up. That's one of the best things that happened to me was that when I, even when I came to New York, I was like, hey, you know, I'm a board op. And the local guy was like, yeah, yeah, that's great. Go pull cable. You know, and then I did. I had to <laughs> go pull cable again here in New York for a long time and, and work your way up. But once you start working, it's like, Hey, are you available for this? Yeah, I'm available. Great. And then you're there. And then you start proving your worth. You start, oh, and then you start working your way up. And the next thing you know, it's like, wow, this person knows what they're doing or they're responsible. So how so, many yeah. years did that process take you? Like when they were like pulling some cable to where you are now, how many years did that take you? Yeah. Um, so let's see. I moved back to New York full time. Let's take my New York trajectory. I think it's yep. I worked full time doing film in 2013. Let's see. By the end of 2013, I was an onset third, getting like full onset experience, being an onset guy. By the end of 2014, I think that's when I got my first bo- like board op gig that like it was like mine. And then definitely like, yeah. And then like 2015, 2016, or maybe it was 2015. So uh, yeah, so a couple of years. It took a couple of years to get to to this point. You know, you're not going to get in and start board hopping right away. That's just yeah. not and you know yeah. what? That's a good thing because you need to know everything that's happening in order to get to that level. It's just like you're not going to be a gaffer day one. Like even yeah. if let's say you're gaffing in like a non-union world and blah, 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 that's great. If you get yourself up to a non-union gaffer world, that's great. Don't expect that that means you're going to be gaffing at a union level. No. Because it's just it's really big and you're not used to like sort of this level of, of, of bigness. 
And so fine, work your way up. Let's say in the non-union world, you do get to that point where, yeah, I, I am, I am a gaffer on some big non-union um, stuff. That's great. And then you, know, you can translate those skills into when you go into union. What are the advantages of the union? I think we should talk about that for a second. Yeah. The yeah. The union? Um, because there are some people who stay in the non-union world and they do find they do great. Okay. But what are the advantages of the, of the union world? Number one is health and safety. You're going to show up every day and you have a union backing you up to make sure you're going to have health and safety protocols and you have someone to call to be like, uh, they're putting us in a dangerous situation and they can come down and be like, this isn't safe. These workers need to work safe. Okay. Every day you are guaranteed a good wage. So it's funny. Linda Phillips does this all the time from our set. You know, oh, we'll get a new guy that shows up. We'll get a new guy that shows up. And, and Linda works as a third, okay, which is like the, you know, just a little regular lady. She's not a board op. She's not a gaffer. She wants to stay a third. So when new guy shows up on day one, she'll turn, you know, and if he's like slacking real bad, you may be like, bro, you and I are making the same amount of money today. <laughs> and that's true. There is no yeah. like apprentice or internship program. Once you start working a union job, the second you're there, you're under a union contract, even if you don't have a card yet. Day one, you're going to pay just as much as every as every other third, and it's a very high paying rate. You know, it's a well paying job, and so like, but it's like you're guaranteed that. Plus, you're guaranteed um, m- uh, money that's going towards your health care. You can get a health care plan. You get money that's going towards your pension. You get a pension plan and a retirement plan, and you also have access to a 401k plan, mm-hmm. and so you can invest in your retirement. Young people invest in retirement as early as you can. If you put a thousand dollars away when you're 21, that thing's going to be worth, you know, $50,000 when you're 70 and you don't want to work, trust me. And that's yeah. just, a thousand. you yeah. know what I mean? Like, so just put, just save it, put it in a, just a decent mutual fund. Don't worry about it. It's there and it's doing fine. You know what I mean? Like the sooner you can work towards these things, plus you're going to care about things about healthcare. You can get off your parents' insurance at 26, right? Yeah. Um, you're going to care about these things like healthcare and what have you for you, your family. And it's an excellent healthcare plan, you know? And they also guarantee that the work also is like crewed up properly, that you're not going to be left with like doing like way too much and injuring yourself and stuff like that. So it's a lot of work and safety protocols, um, a guaranteed good wage, um, and health and welfare benefits. Before we, I've yeah, I guess, let's talk things, about so. that for a second sure. because a lot of people are like, what is a shop steward? And yeah. I know you don't get paid extra for this lovely responsibility of being like the crew sure. to producer well, t- just, well, that's not entirely true. This is what okay. the shop steward We don't get paid from, from production. Uh, Local 52 um, will pay your dues for every quarter you are a shop steward. That's not bad. So, How much are dues? Um, so the dues are on average anywhere from like 67 to $75 each, each local decides like, okay, this is how it works. The international still sells the IATSE stamp to yeah. the locals and the locals can decide to add on extra money to help raise money for their local. So like, I think I pay 75 bucks for my one stamp every quarter and I pay 67, I think for my other stamps because they, the different jurisdictions are around that amount, 67, 75 bucks each quarter. Uh-huh. So for every quarter that you're a shop steward, the local just do that because it's, yeah, it's not something you make money off of, but what does the shop steward do? How does it work? Basically the shop steward is there to make sure that the contract is being enforced on your set. Cause let's face it, uh, local 52 or whoever your local is, they can't be on every set all across America all the time. Right. They are, you know, they have the representatives. Right. And also to like, look at like safety situations, health situations that seem like a red flag. So the way it's uh, listed with OSHA, you have to take a lunch break or meal break every six hours. That is an OSHA rule, okay? And so we accept that we do that. So when you get up to that six hours, say you want to keep filming, believe it or not, you're not supposed to just call Grace. You're yeah. supposed to ask, ask for, for it. Yep. You ask for Grace because that means we're going to keep the camera in this certain position, make minor adjustments, and you get 12 minutes of not paying us a, um, a penalty. That goes through the shop store. Also, it's nice. It's sort of a conversation to be like, hey, steward, we're probably going to buy one or two meal penalties in order to do the public. Well, let's say it gets super egregious and they're buying meal penalties to the point where it's like, holy cow. Yeah. We just work 10 and a half hours without a break. The shop steward can start being like, 
look, we appreciate all the money, <laughs> but there's, there's a little bit of a safety issue at this point now. Yeah. There's not really food happening. These people aren't getting a break. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's 110 degrees out, right? It's not safe or it's below, you know, it's 20 below. It's not safe. Uh, we're standing, you know, you have a technician who's literally, you know, over the East river. That's not so safe. You know what I mean? Whatever it is. Um, so the shop steward would sort of be that liaison between the crew and production to sort of like work through those issues because then also it's like it's also then a, a touching off point for the crew so if the crew is like man this is so, you know this ain't working talk to your shop steward tell your yeah. shop steward have the shop steward bring it up so then there's like one channel then the shop steward can get on the phone hey local 52 or, or whatever you know whatever wherever jurisdiction you're in we've got a problem this is what's going on the upm will not honor it we got an issue here and then they might step in and they'll call the upm and be like hey what's going on you know we, we have to straighten this out we want to keep working nobody wants yeah. to stop working, yeah right? because it's in everyone's best interest to keep the job flowing but we want to work stiff we all want to go home we all want to go home with both limbs right we want to go yes. to bed nobody wants to get hurt you know on any level whatsoever and so that so that's important so that's basically what the shop steward does so it enforces what's in the, the contract already looks out for safety protocols um, and, and communicates these things between the crew uh, production and if they have to communicate with the union about like if there's anything that, that's not going on raise it to a higher level. If you're a shop steward do you feel I mean have you been a shop steward? Yes. So do you feel like it causes friction for you as a person and for your position because I feel like it might get a little political at all or do you think no? no. Uh, no, no, no. You're like, no. <laughs> you know, you don't want the heat. Get out of the kitchen. I mean, like, sure. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, like, I, 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 sure. Can it get ridiculous? Of course. I, I mean, I, I happen to be a shop steward with a UPM that was ridiculous. And I had to like call him on it many times. Welcome to the real world. <laughs> Welcome to being an adult. Like, I don't know what, what to tell you. I mean, the bottom line is we want to be safe. You're not out to get the producer. That's yeah. not your job to go. Yeah. I'm out to get the No, that's not your job. Your job is to make sure that everybody's safe. Everybody's safe. safe. And yeah. the, listen, and let's be honest. There's sometimes I hear complaints from crew members and it's like. It's a little d ridiculous sometimes. Like, what are you, what are you actually complaining about? Like that? Yeah, that's you ridiculous. Know? The bottom line is it's like, okay, well, where is that in the contract that you're supposed to have chocolate chip cookies at three? I don't see that. <laughs> Don't see it in the contract. Would you like me to go fight for cookies? Oh. That, that's what you care about now. That's what I'm fighting for. I, I don't think that, you know, you, you make those decisions. Yeah, it's like pick your battles. It's, I mean, it, it's no. like you got to. Yeah, cookies, that's the hill to die on. Not so much. No. no. <laughs> but, okay, as a, working in the indie world as a first AD, and, and I remember working on a feature film, and, and the key grip was like the shop steward. Because, I mean, there were. Right. some safety issues and it was always like they came to me and I had to talk to the producers and I'm like dude I'm not fighting for more food at crafty I don't care how hungry you are there is food right. we have meals you're not complaining right. about crafty to me right now I have a set to run leave me alone <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know yes, and, yes. And, and like yeah. with um something I wanted to add with the oh god I completely forgot what I was going to say about the shop um oh with, with production since like in the union world, on the production side, and I hear what the ADs are saying, and I yes. hear what they say about the shop steward, and I hear, like, yeah. the sh because the ADs sometimes see it as, it's a time thing. It's the time suck, right? Because yeah. sometimes if you have to pause something, we're just like, oh, my God, yeah. they're complaining about something now, and we have mm -hmm. to pause production, and it really, like, ADs are, like, losing their minds. Like, let's just figure this out. Hurry up. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it's, it's always kind of seen as, like, you guys are the bad guys. You know, it's like, it, but not really at the same time because we understand what you have to do, right. but we also hate the process. <laughs> well, look, everybody's got a job. Everybody's got a job to be on set. I'm sorry that your job is hall monitor, okay? Yeah. I, like, <laughs> so true. Like, sorry. Then don't be the hall monitor. I don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and you see this. I mean, let's, I mean, not to make this dark, but let's go back to uh, what happened with what's her name? Was it uh, Sarah Jones? Sarah Gideon? Sarah Jones, you know, what's yeah. up, what happened there? No, yeah. that was, the, no, who ended up going in front of, uh, 
an actual, it was the first AD and the first director. AD, always, always. I tell everyone that I train, I tell them like, listen, safety is a huge thing. And I tell them about Sarah Jones and I tell them like, if you become a first AD, if you want to become a first AD, you will go to jail if someone dies on your set. And, and if the shop, and listen, and if the shop court. steward is saying this is a safety issue, you know, uh, you better listen. You better yeah. take it and stop because you know what you don't want? You don't want someone injured because you yeah. know what takes longer? Dealing with an injury. Yeah. Or worse. You know, and so no, you you you, you have to take the time to do that, and it's yeah. built in. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Listen, I get it that you're on a time schedule, but especially here in the extremely for-profit, very rich union world that we work yeah. in, and the overlords of whoever NBC and Netflix, they got the money. Yo, yeah, they have money to wait five minutes to make it safe and do it. You know, yeah. no matter how ah, we get, okay, like you know. Yeah. I don't we get it. We all know we're on our time crunch. We work quick and efficiently knowing that it's time crunch. You know what I mean? And we also know, guess what? We don't work quick and efficiently. Guess what will happen? We'll get fired. Our yeah. gaffer, our key grip, whoever is our head, will get fired. Yeah. And then we won't have a job, you know? And so like, we care about that as well. We get how this is, how this works. But at the same time, you know, going back to what is the point of the shop steward, shop steward is there to help reinforce. Listen, this contract was painstakingly negotiated and fought over and producers yeah. were at the table they were there spelling yeah. it out at the table and we fight and this is what we get and this is what it says and we need to enforce it that's how that's how the world works yeah you i think know? i think a lot of people who are i think they don't take safety seriously enough because i mean i've had this so many times on like indie sets where it's like well i want to do this shot i'm like I don't care. <laughs> I don't. And I've had to make that call where like one instance was, a, um, it was like a um, two day short film. And the director was like, you know what I want? Let's use this roll gate. I want my actor's hand to go underneath the roll gate as it's coming down. And I was like, no, we're not doing that. Cause I'm not going to have someone lose their goddamn arm for your shot. Like, what are you insane? Right. And the director right. and the DP were like, Hmm. I'm like, figure it out. Cause we're not doing that shot. Figure out something else. And like, right. it takes a strong personality to be like, no, to like the powers yes. that be, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, no, dude. The, hard, listen, the hardest thing is saying no. And yeah. so it's like, how do you say that in a way that still keeps the process going forward? Yeah. You know, um, you know, and, and so, I mean, I always go back to how can we do this safely? How can we do this? Safely? Yeah. Always start with, that's great. We all want that. But how do we do it safely? You know what I mean? Like, you know. Talking about your path, do you, all, yeah. do you see yourself like uh, moving in a different direction as far as like, do you see yourself gaffing more or maybe being a deep? Because people well, are always we, worried about sure. the, the ladder yeah. and like what the ultimate yeah, 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 goal yeah. is, you know? Yeah. Well, what's the famous joke? What do grips and electric both have in common? Oh, they God. both don't want to be electric. <laughs> It's always that famous joke that electrics are always like, well, really, I'm a DP. Well, really, I have a screenplay, but I'm electric. You know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm actually very happy where I am. I worked really hard to become a board op. It is a key position. Yeah. I actually get paid the same rate as a gaffer. And for me to open up my financial opportunities, I'm starting now to work on getting gear that's specific to what I do and then like and buffing out my kit and renting it back to the company yeah. so that then like when I'm hired, it also comes with this particular nuanced light board and I can make everything go so much quicker, you know, and how that works to help benefit my gaffer, benefit the DP and move, uh, move things forward. So I'm actually at like kind of a pinnacle, like this is kind of, yeah. to, to, you know, to be a full-time board up on a thing is a big deal and to get into that place. And many, many folks kind of stay at that until they retire. Some move into gaffing. I mean, yeah, if gaffing became a thing for me down the road, sure. I mean, yeah, great. You know what I mean? I don't see that as a current thing. Yeah. I'm working for a really great gaffer, you know what I mean? Like, and I'm enjoying it and I want to continue to foster that relationship. I want to get better as a board op because other, the next level of board opping is programming. What do I mean by programming? Like when you see like massive moving light rigs and when you see massive like lights, like moving and oh it looks like a fire or it looks like you know uh, this massive led sign yeah that's stuff i don't do as much of and i want to get better at that so like actually during the pandemic i have been taking some online classes trying to get better at working with led i've been doing it um virtually and without i don't own any led lights so it's not like i can set one up in my bedroom and do yeah. it but i've been doing it as best i can learning blah 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 
that would be kind of the next step for me is I can move into be more of a programmer because then programmers can get paid like kind of like how steady cam operators get paid more when they're steady cam operators. Yeah. If I show up and program like during like let's use New Amsterdam for an example, the day that I um do you remember we did the ice skating rink? Were you there for that? Yes, I remember you being very excited about programming yeah. and doing all because that. I was programming that day. Well, I actually got paid more that day. I got paid yeah. above scale. And so like that was exciting because it was I was programmers using lots of moving lights. I was constantly boom, boom, boom. I had to see what I was doing. I'd be totally, you know, and it was a lot to do and it, we had to move quickly. Um, so that's the next level for me. And like I said, if like somehow gaffing fell into that, sure. Like I have a buddy who was, um, for you, a good example. He was a, a board op on Madam Secretary. Okay. And because he was like kind of like the most experienced person there, instead of doing like uh, what, what most crews do where like the best boy steps up. Yeah. They had like a second board op. And so then the board op stepped up and gaffed on days of scouts or tandems mm -hmm. and they had someone else work the board. And then that way he also got super familiar with what was going on a lot. And he could, when he goes back to the board, he kind of was like more in sync. And then what happened was that gaffer had another gig at one point in time. And so then that board op finished and gaffed like the last season of the huh. show. That's um, not always the case. That's a, you know, typically the gaffer route for the junior, you usually are a best boy for a while yeah. and you start a gap, you stepping in and gaffing, you know, like you're, and then you get like, usually you are like the fill in gaffer for this. You gaff the second unit here, you gaff the smaller unit there. And then eventually, Eventually, like you then put your name in the hat for a bigger gig or you get promoted within that gig. I thought of a random question. Uh, yeah. So how do you see gaffers move up into the DP position a lot? Or is that like uh, a common? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, okay. So for the, de for the director of photography route, there are a few ways to go there. Yeah, I so, figure there's uh, a few. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. There's just a few ways. You can work your way up in camera. You know, you can, you know, um, like you see people, they like start as a loader and then their first AC, second, you know, second AC, first AC, uh, great. Now they're this great operator and, all, and then they, you know, get bumped up to DP. There's that route. Um, I have seen, like, for example, the current gaffer on Blue Bloods, excuse me, DP on Blue Bloods was the gaffer on Blue uh -huh. Bloods for years and years and years. And then that DP wanted to retire. And it just kind of made sense because it was like he had been in his, his, his pocket for so long that it just kind of made sense for that gaffer to step up and be the DP. That also happened on the good wife, now good fight, same type of thing. Then I also know people who are electrics who don't make it all the way up to gaffer who actually are like electrics and are like, you know, working really hard as an electric to get their skills down. But then I'll, are also working hard as a DP and they'll take a low paying feature as a DP. They'll then do um, a tier and be a, and, and, and be a gaffer just so they can like work with this particular DP. Right. right? Yeah. And then they might go back to being a third on like a big set. Then next, you know what they, they work really hard and maybe they do get in because with 600, with six, okay, so to get into 52, everybody gets in your in, and then you can work your way up within 52. Uh -huh. 600 is different. Yeah. Uh, 600, sorry, IATSE 600, if you haven't gone over this, that's the local that covers camera. Now with 600, you have to go in as the designation. Yes. So for example, I have a buddy right now, good for him. He was just kind of like a third, bested here and there, gaffed small things here and there, then worked really hard on being a DP on the side all the time, developed his demo reel, then all of a sudden, boom, now he, he came into 600 as a DP. Wow. And so he has a 52 card and now he has a 600 card as a DP and works as a DP, you know, as much as he can. And so that, there's that route as well. Yeah. If you want to do sort of the, like learn how to be an onset technician before you get into the director of photography world, people do that route as well. Yeah. Or they do, like I said, the more camera route, just stay in camera. Cause if you go in at 600 as a loader or second AC, you pay so much and you're at that. You're not allowed to bump up until you've like done so many days and proved blah, 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 and you can slowly bump up. But then you have to like, it's almost like you're getting a new card because yeah. then you're like at the next level and you have to stay at the level or you're at this next level and you have to stay at that level. So is there anything else that you do? Um, because I've heard like people being part of like, certain union boards and um, there's yeah. a lot of different yeah, things you guys sure, do sure. that's like extracurricular. Uh, yeah, sure. So there, I mean, there's a bunch of things. So, so there's anything from like political action. Okay. Like I've done, like I, I'm a big politics guy. So I've done like political action, uh, you know, organized to get people. We went to a March, a, a labor March, a, you know, we, we did the Labor Day parade or the women's March. We had a representative group from local 52, et cetera. Um, so there are groups that just like through the hall. And if you want to just step a volunteer, boom. Um, 
then there are people who sit on our executive board and they are the working technicians. Like, um, like the head of our department is this guy Rocco. He's the rigging gaffer on jobs. He is known as a really great rigging gaffer and he is the, um, on the executive board of local 52 and is there at the big meeting and he gets the input. Same thing with like, you know, um, the grip representative. He's like a key grip on a job somewhere. And then he also is the, the grip representative. I think it's important that in those positions, you have people who are working still. And yeah. Know what's going on the day. Now our president and our vice president, that's all they do. Right. You gotcha. know, because they're too busy just doing that. So like our president, and our vice president, you know, and we even have this other role. Um, this woman, Mandy is the local 52 shop steward. So if you have a problem and you need to go to the hall, I usually call her first because mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. her job is to just work with the shop stewards, get out and, and, and deal with it. If it has to go more above her, then fine. She worked as a prop for like 15 years or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then she worked in the job. Now she just does that. And she only gets paid from the hall. And that's all she does, you know, is that kind of thing. So, yeah, so there is stuff within uh, the union itself to get engaged. I tell everybody, get involved. One of the things that get, gets my goat is when <laughs> um, I have union members complain about the union. And I say, well, when's the last meeting you went to? Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, then I, I don't really care what you have to say or complain about. Why don't you show up at the meeting and raise the point? This isn't their union. It's our union. Mm-hmm. Take ownership of it. Jump in. Do jump in. I brought up a point at a union meeting three years ago, and now it is in our contract. Oh, that's because amazing. Of voices that I raise, and then other members stepped up and like, yeah, boom, boom, boom. This this was messed up. How can producers do this and do that? Now it's in our contract because yeah. you bring it up. You keep going. It's just like legislation. You yeah. bring it up, you keep going, and then the president knows this is important to my members. And then when he's sitting across from the producers, he can go, listen, this is important to my members. How can we make this work? And the producers are like, well, what about this? No. What about that? Maybe. What about that? Okay, fine. Yay. Yeah. And now there's something in there to help. You know, yeah. that's how it works. I guess maybe one question I didn't ask was how you get jobs, you yourself. Like, is it just oh, working yeah. out so for your yeah, role? Uh, Both. The way it works is if you, okay. You've come to New York, you producers, come to New York, sign a contract with um, the lo- with IATSE, the locals and the producers and the union and, uh, you know, SAG after, everybody's on board, right? So once you start hiring, um, you start hiring, hiring heads, right? You start hiring, you know, like the gaffers, the, the key grips, the blah, 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 right? All the heads get, get, get hired, you know, uh, lead men, et cetera. And then from that, they then hire their crew. Now you have to hire local 52 members first you have to you have, they have to be active card members now there are a couple of ways for that to happen it is people you know and you've worked with now, so let's say i don't have a job right now like i don't because of the pandemic yeah even though i hear new amsterdam is coming back at some point i have been reaching out to gaffers to best boys to people i've worked with other board ops hey keep me in mind and i'm willing to be a third i'll, I'll I, I don't you know like i have lots of responses i have two kids you know what i mean i'm willing to jump yeah. in whatever i'll go work as a third you know uh, pulling cable somewhere so i contact them and they are free to hire me because i am an active member i'm not you know i don't have a lapsed card i don't not have a card they can just hire me Boom. i also call in and put my name on the list so we have an availability list so say you're here and you're like god who's available i don't even know anybody out there you can look at the availability list on the local 52 site and you can pull down the electrics grips props set dressing whomever whatever department and you can hire somebody off the list the phone number's there call them up hey frank you available tomorrow you available next week blah, blah, blah. and you can just hire them for those days and they can just fill in their days mm-hmm. um based on the other list. You also can call in and you're like, listen, I'm looking for this many people. Then the hall might say, hey, you got to hire off the list. I got Frank still on the list. I got these other four people. You got to hire one of those people off the list. And then the person's like, oh, well, I don't know that person, but sure, I'll, I'll take them. Or you could, it can get to the point where there's no list. Then yeah. that's when the hall starts sending your, you know, non-card members, which are like the permit guys and guys from who have cards from other locals. And then they start sending those people out. And that gets assigned by the hall. So everything has to go through the hall. They have to know where we're working, when we're working, and then you can get assigned in that way. And that's how it worked. But yeah, but if I, I'm, I'm a free agent, I can go somewhere, you know, and work elsewhere and just contact them directly and they can hire me because I am a standing member. But it's, I think uh, it's pretty important to have your own network because the more people that know yes. you, even though you're yes. in the union, people are like, yes. oh, I know Frank, so he's in the union and I can hire him. And one of the best things about Local 52 is that permit system. People complain about that permit system. It's great. Because listen, I came to New York, I knew a kind of a couple of people, but then all of a sudden, you know, the hall assigned me. It was like, all right, I'm available. Ray calls me back. All right, Frank, you're going to go work for so-and-so tomorrow. Call this guy. 
Hey, Ray sent me to you. Okay. You show up day one, you work real hard. All of a sudden this guy's like, Hey, you're pretty good. Can you come back tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. So after I was done being a permit, which means you don't have your card, but you're working towards your card. Yeah. I walked home with you know, 15 to 20, 30 gaffers and best boys on my phone, like yeah. ready to go, like who I could call tomorrow. And they'll be like, Oh yeah, that's right. You did a great job when you worked for me. Oh yeah. I know you, you, you know, you get more known. And, and I met like, you know, that's how you meet all the people and you do a good job on their crew and you bounce from crew to crew and, and you learn. It's also how you learn how people work. It's how you learn like how it gets done. You kind of learn like yeah. the way to do it so that then you can kind of like fit in with each crew. And you also start to learn like, maybe I don't want to work for that guy. <laughs> just want to say thank you for watching and also thank you to Frank for letting me interview him he is a friend of mine in film I love talking to him he is so excited about what he does and you, his passion definitely comes through so thank you for watching I hope you gained something from this video and he's such a wealth of knowledge so thank you so much Frank for doing this interview for me and Beyond Film School and if you like this video I'm pretty sure you're gonna like the video on the screen